conference. If he spent as much time corresponding by email with the others as he did with me, he's been doing nothing else for the last couple of months. Um, but it's all worked out very well. It's a marvelously organized conference. Uh, now, um, I uh, have noticed that several points in this conference, points of contact with what I'm going to say. Um, and for example, in the last session on Simmel, with Nicholas de Warren mentioned Simmel's Heraclitean conception of the constant uh, change involved in constant circulation of money. That connection between Heraclitus and money is far, far closer than Simmel could realize in the year 1900. Um, but I just confine myself to uh, taking a position in relation to what Joel Kay was saying yesterday evening, uh, because of course we share, we're well, unusual in sharing, the conviction that uh, nature, uh, <clears throat> the conception of nature is influenced by monetization. Now, uh, he uh, <clears throat> has developed that for 13th, 14th century Europe. I've developed it for 6th century BC Greece. And in, when that happens, it's very interesting because we, we, we come from rather different angles, but we've reached a similar methodological conclusion. The thing to do there is to look at the similarities that result and the differences that result. And of course, <clears throat> a basic differences are three basic societal um, differences. Firstly, um, 13th century Europe was not a society that was beginning to be monetized from the first time by the invention of coinage. Coinage had been around a long time. Secondly, of course, 13th century they had Aristotle as the basic point of reference for their uh, thoughts about nature and money and so on. And thirdly, the sort of people that Joel's talking about, who he has shown us deeply engaged in financial administration, well, they're quite different from these pre-Socratic philosophers. Uh, I don't think any of them would have got anywhere near uh, financial administration. But I'll come back to that point later, because it makes a real difference to their conceptions of the universe. By the way, I put philosophy here in um, inverted commas, because of course philosophy can mean many different things. I'm using it to mean simply the attempt to understand the universe as an impersonal system, crudely put. And there have been many other you know, conceptions of philosophy, but that's the one particularly useful. Um, it might also be called natural science. When, um, when we look at pre socratic philosophers, some people would say, well, they're, they're just sort of proto-natural scientists, rather than philosophers after the word philosophy wasn't invented until much later. And they're not interested as Socrates and Plato were in the analysis of language. Um, okay, now, uh, I should say that uh, what I'm going to do is to very briefly give an account of what I've published already on this theme, just to give you a basic orientation and uh, um, then I'm going to say new stuff, which, which I haven't published, which I, much of which I've been thinking about over the last few months. And of course, my hypothesis about the importance of monetization in understanding the genesis and early form of philosophy is a hypothesis, like any other hypothesis, it gains in strength by explaining material, uh, new material. And I found that this so much falls into place if you adopt my hypothesis. My hypothesis is capable of explaining things that I never thought would be explained by the hypothesis when I started developing. I'll just give you a few examples of that. Um, now, much of what I have published on the subject is in my book of 18 years ago, Money and the Early Green Mind. And there are three pillars to the argument about the importance for monetization, the first pervasively monetized society in history was the Greek polis of the sixth century as a result of the invention and rapid spread of coinage. 
And the three pillars of the argument are, uh, first of all, that the first ever pervasively monetized society in history was Ionia from about 600 BC, which was also this, this where philosophy developed for the first time. The fit is astonishing. Same time, exactly. Same place, exactly. And by the way, um, that aerial photograph shows you how small the cradle of Western thought is. You've got, you've got Ephesus, there the top, uh, the home of Heraclitus, Samos, the home of Pythagoras, and Miletus, where the first philosophers of all the Milesian school came from, uh, Thales, Anaximander, Miletus, and Anaximenes. Actually, of course, in antiquity, Miletus and Ephesus were courts. This is an alluvial plain that has been created over the last two and a half thousand years. Now, um, so that's the first pillar of the argument. The second is what I call cosmization, uh, a word I've begun to use relatively recently. And this is the process by which social order is imagined. Um, cosmic order is imagined as social order. It's an extremely common process. It's rather under theorized, but I'll be returning to that phenomenon uh, a bit later. Um, and you will help me with it because I, I'm not sure I really understood it thoroughly. Um, but then thirdly, there's content and the, the earliest philosophy throughout the sixth century uh, shares the belief that everything is transformed from and into one substance, which is impersonal, all powerful, and progressively abstract. Now, that is true of the pre Socratic cosmos. It's also true of money. So you have the astonishing fit in time and place, astonishing fit in content, and you also have the basic process cosmization, which explains the astonishing fits. Right now, um, I should stress at this point that I do not regard myself as guilty of monocausality. We had not mentioned that yesterday, that there is a single cause for the origin and early form of Greek philosophy, and that single cause was money. I've spent an awful lot of time showing how, for example, mystery cult, ritual, animal sacrifice is part of a complex matrix which includes money, which produces Greek philosophy and Indian philosophy, because um, among the things I've done since writing the book Money in the Early Green Mind was to write another book of about the same length uh, entitled The Origins of Ancient Philosophy in the Origins of Philosophy in Ancient Greece and Ancient India, a historical comparison. So I decided I'd spent you know 30 years with the Greeks. I needed a break. So I spent years reading early Indian texts, learning a certain amount of Sanskrit, not very much, because there are extraordinary similarities between early Greek philosophy and early Indian philosophy, basically the Upanishads. The Upanishads are astonishing texts, because I was reading them in English. You first read the Upanishads, which are pretty much contemporary with this philosophy, and I didn't understand a word of it. And the second time I read it, it was getting a bit easier. Third time I read these texts, I was completely gripped, as Schopenhauer was, by these texts. Um, anyway, that's, that was my adventure into Indian thought. And I produced an explanation of these astonishing similarities. I won't go into this because I'm going to be talking about Greek philosophy. And that explanation is one which is Religiously hostile to the standard of reflex explanation of these sorts of similarity, which is influence. Used to be the Greeks influencing the Indians, now it's the Indians influencing the Greeks. Both of those things are complete nonsense. They could not have, for reasons I set out at length in my book, there could have been no influence. Uh, and, but it's the sort of stand, you know, people often imagine the ancient world as like full of international conferences like this one. <laughs> people reading each other, listening to each other, and so on. No, the Brahmins, I won't give it to you, but you can read it all in my book. Um, so that's one extension of my thesis, was to India. Uh, but I, I've also emphasized, I'll mention this briefly, 
the importance of monetization to the understanding of tragedy. Now, uh, because this in a sense threatens the overall argument, because monetization has these enormous cultural consequences, not just in one field, but in more than one field. And that makes my whole thesis, I think, more plausible for reasons I won't go into in much detail. Athenian tragedy is, in the context of ancient literary production, an extraordinary thing. Because ancient literatures are according to genre, pastoral poetry, wedding songs, processional songs, epic, and so on. And they all arise from events. I'm, I mean, poetic performances, a pastoral songs, shepherds singing a wedding song, and wedding, and the rest of it. The one big exception to that is tragedy. Moreover, tragedy doesn't gradually evolve. It comes to be very quickly. Suddenly you've got tragedy. Suddenly you've got the first drama in world history at the end of the sixth century BC. And my colleagues are curiously incurious souls. I mean, I have to say that my, um, I can skip a little autobiography about this because uh, I was um, educated in this rather, a strange, self-contained academic discipline called classical scholarship. And my PhD was the editing and very careful commentary on an ancient Greek text, a dramatic text. And in the course of doing that commentary, I realized there, are, there were problems I couldn't solve without knowing about ritual, because there was evocation of study Greek ritual. Then I realized I couldn't understand the ritual without understanding more about the religion. So I moved out to religion. And then I realized that this was a religion of the polis. So I said, I, I better understand the polis. I'm into politics. And then um, I realized, of course, I couldn't understand the polis without understanding the economy. And that's where I am at the moment. So uh, my intellectual biography has been a kind of moving from the center through concentric, ever larger concentric circles. I don't know where I'm going to go next. Maybe a careful study of the Greek future subjunctive or something. <laughs> anyway, um, and, and so uh, I began to be interested in these very big questions about the origins of these fundamental uh, contributions to humanity, like philosophy and tragedy, and their early form, which is not what classical scholars do. You know who else is going to do it? They don't do it. Uh, and so I asked myself, what, what was there about Athenian history in the years leading up to this sudden birth of tragedy? What, what Nietzsche calls the birth of tragedy. Of course, he, what he writes about is it's just total nonsense. It's some metaphysical event. He has no interest in history. Um, dreadful influence on the study of tragedy, Nietzsche. Uh, anyway, uh, his other stuff's quite good, but... Uh, that book is absolutely awful. It's embarrassing. But um, what happened then in Athens in the years leading up to the tragedy? I'll tell you what happened. Coinage was introduced from Ionia by the middle of the fifth century, maybe 540s, 530s, and very quickly pervaded Athenian society, right? In the vast literature on tragedy, which would fill this room, nobody has ever mentioned that fact. This is to me. Completely astonishing. And moreover, it's because in my book on Easter 2016, I kind of set out how it worked, you know, how monetization is preconditioned for the development of tragedy. Um, the institution of tragedy, the form of tragedy, but also the content of tragedy, which I will briefly mention. At the center of tragedy, and the, this is the first time I think it happens in literature, uh, I, might, I might be overgeneralizing there because there might be stuff um, in ancient literature. Is the total isolation of the Oedipus, Creo, Pentheus are completely alienated from the gods and from their own closest kin, who they kill or are killed by. Uh, and there's nothing like that in Homer, for example. And some of these figures, Creo, Pentheus, Beautiful. So obsessed with money. Um, and what money does is to isolate the individual. That's as well known. Because money provides you with your personal property over which you have control. And in principle, you don't need the previous basic 
social relations of, of kinship, of religious association, of reciprocity, and so on and so forth. The, the miser is the extreme example of the completely isolated individual. There, there is no completely isolated individual before monetization. I'll come back to that point later on. And finally, the third area to which I've um, registered the importance of monetization is the development of the conception of the, of the self. I mean, we had earlier the session about Simmel stressing the importance of money for self fashioning Well, the Greeks were doing that in spades. Um, there is, before the sixth century BC, I think Heraclitus is the first, there is no conception of the self-contained inner self. Now that sounds a bit odd. Well, what is that? Well, in Homer, you have various organs of consciousness, you know, an organ of anger, an organ of thinking, or so, but no self-contained unified inner self it doesn't exist. And that's true of quite a lot of the ethnology as well, particularly of the Far East. These are societies which just don't have what we think is given to us by nature, but it isn't, which is a conception of the unified inner self. That conception arrives in Greece. Why does it arrive? It's quite a big change. And my answer to that is that, firstly, of course, money, as I just said, isolates the individual. Money, because it's so easily owned uh, and used by the individual, constitutes the individual as an owner of property. And in this process, what happens is that the, the uh, money as an abstract unifier of multiplicity, of concrete multiplicity. That's what money does. It is an abstract unifier of concrete mul multiplicity, goods and so on. Is interjected into the psyche or as the psyche. And Plato actually says this quite openly, he refers to the inner self as nomisma. Now, I'm not gonna go more into that because I'm be losing my main focus. But those are then three areas. Tragedy was India. There's the conceptions of the inner self to which the importance of monetization also applies. But let's get back to uh, Greek philosophy. Um, I'll give you <clears throat> the first ever philosophical fragment from Anaximander, the only substantial fragment of Anaximander from Miletus that survives. And very often we don't know what the ipsism of verba of the philosopher were, the words he actually wrote, and which were simply the words of the latest scholar reporting what he wrote. But um, <clears throat> the bit he definitely wrote is, and from which existing thing are, oh, and I'll start at the beginning, because this is actually, I'm not going to go into too much detail with these fragments of the pre philosophers, but this is quite important. I've given it to you because it's just a setting out right from the beginning. What I referred to earlier was the idea that, that all things in the world are a single substance. A single substance is transformed from and into everything else, which is what you find generally in pre-Socratic philosophy. And Maximander said that the principle and element of existing things was to appear on, the unlimited or indefinite, being the first to introduce this name of the principle. He says that it, the principle, is neither water nor any of the so-called elements, but some other aperos, unlimited nature, from which all the heavens and the cosmos in them came into being. These are his words. And from which things, existing things, have their genesis into these things also occurs their perishing according to necessity. For they give penalty and retribution to each other for their injustice according to the disposition or assessment of time. That's the first ever. Um, a proto-scientific fragment, because uh, the, 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 the existing things uh, which sort of emerge from the <laughs> apparel <laughs> and merge back into it are generally regarded as the opposites. We do know a certain amount about what Anaximander said, not from other quotations, this is the only one uh, that survives, uh, but from reports of what he said. And uh, so, and, and so it's, it's very striking. Um, now, I, I should say that 
one of the advantages of my hypothesis, it doesn't really have any rivals. Most, the most pre Socratic <laughs> philosophers, if you say, well, you know, why did philosophy begin there and then? Why did it take the form that it did? Um, I think Charles had a similar problem. Uh, they, they, uh, they would regard that either as irrelevant or unanswerable. It's not that they've tried to answer it, it's just unanswerable or irrelevant. And or ignored, basically. Anyway, um, there are nevertheless two accounts of the, how why philosophy began, when, where it did. And I'll very briefly mention them. One is by the remarkable French scholar Jean Paul Vernon, who says it's all about the development of the polis. Because the polis, unlike the Assyrian monarchy or whatever, is a society in equilibrium. With checks and balances, and the Maximatus Cosmos is rather like that, which it is, um, and that's the basic explanation of this philosophy. You have a sort of impersonal system, not ruled by a single person, but embodying checks and balances, and that is projected onto the cosmos. Now, that there is some truth in that. At least he's trying to give some historical explanation. This is not just saying, well, this is the Greek genius suddenly arriving in the world. Um, and the other, the other one is barely worth mentioning by an eminent scholar called Jeffrey Lloyd, who thinks it's all a matter of freedom. Because in the policy of freedom, speak what you wanted to speak. Um, this doesn't work historically at all. I've, re I've, re I've refuted both these explanations in my book in some detail. It doesn't work historically, but also it has a real bourgeois feel about it. Yes. And it's as if all those Egyptian priests you know, they would have come up with the rules of formal logic or an impersonal universe, were it not for the fact that it would have got them into deep trouble. No, absolute nonsense. That's not how, how intellectual um, uh, processes happen at all. Uh, so we can forget that one. But as for Vernon, the basic problem is he ignores the elephant in the room because he can give no account of the unlimited Peron, which is what the world consists of. His political account, you've no explanation of that at all. Uh, it doesn't bother. Um, whereas on my account, of course, a peron is money. In fact, I show there are 10 features of the aperon you know yeah. about. It's unlimited, it's abstract, it unites opposites, a whole number of others, which are also true of money. It is a projection or cosmization of money. And in this particular fragment, it's very interesting because the apparel is there, money is there in the context of paying penalties, giving penalty and retribution to each other for their injustice. Now, we know from early Greek laws that one of the crucial stages in the development of the polis was the setting of fixed penalties in money, right? The, the Homer is, is about the problems of not having fixed penalties, um, but that's true with the Odyssey and the Iliad. And to create a cohesive polis, polis it's a really good enough fixed penalties. Otherwise, you just get the vendetta that goes on and on. But if you have a fixed penalty, you kill my brother, you cut off my arm. Okay. Uh, it's all agreed that the, the uh, penalty for that is 20 drachmas. End of the, end of the uh, potential vendetta. So th this is what money is doing in and this fragment of an x man that fits very well. But money also, of course, at this time is also serving as a means of exchange for a large range of commodities and so on. And when you get to Heraclitus, which is 50 years or so later, that is what is primarily an expression of, but we'll come on to that. Now, um, my next, um, was it my first, uh, example of how my hypothesis is able to explain phenomena that it wasn't designed to explain is the difference between Heraclitus and Parmenides. This is an, in, a difference of some interest nowadays because it represents a lot of different, two different possible views of the universe right now. And, um, Heraclitus believes everything is constantly in flux. Parmenides believes that all that exists is one, 
invariant in time and space, unchanging, eternal to be perceived by the mind rather than by the senses. Nothing changes. Heraclitus, everything changes. Now, that was a very different view, uh, opposite views. And basically, in ancient philosophy, in philosophy generally, but Parmenidean view one. And Plato is basically a Parmenidean. He's not an extreme Parmenidean. Uh, his theory of forms is a really a way of working out how you <clears throat> reconcile in the same world unchanging abstract being with perceptor, with material realities. Okay, so the form of a table is unchanging abstract table, and the table itself is a perceptible, changeable, perishable thing. Um, so Parmenides is view one, but nowadays people think Heraclitus, everything is processed, everything is in change. It's much closer to the truth. Um, well, that brings one into issues with theoretical physics I'm not qualified to talk about. But uh, the problem, you see, for my theory, and somebody once said this at a talk I gave when I was many years ago when I was starting out on this stuff, that look, it just doesn't work because monetization produces on the one hand, Heraclitus, on the other hand, Parmenides, who could hardly be more different. So the same cause is just producing completely different things. Aha, uh -huh. right. Let's see how it does in fact, not only work, but is confirmed by the opposition between Heraclitus and Parmenides. Now you may think at this point, I'm being slightly mad that I'm ready to defend my thesis at all costs, but just look, look at this material. And I have to say, when I um, um, came to, being interested in these things, I, as I said earlier, I'm start, starting from close reading of ancient Greek texts. I didn't approach it from a theoretical point of view. I uh, eventually found myself saying things which converged with theory, including Marxist theory, but I didn't start with that theory. That's a really important point. Now, uh, here, um, here is, a, I think, quite a well-known passage from Marx's Grundrisse. And Marx has just been talking about um, money in antiquity. And he's making the important point, which is always important in understanding antiquity, that antiquity, Greek antiquity, is not a capitalist economy. Money is not uh, naturally, by default, invested. It's not invested in production. There is production, but money is more likely to be hoarded stored than simply invest. This makes an enormous difference to the culture. Okay, by the way, at this point I should say, I much prefer dialogue to monologue. So if anybody um, would like to just intervene, just raise your hand. If, you, if I say something outrageous or um, just simply wrong. Now, this is, uh, having said that, um, Marx points to what he calls <clears throat> the contradiction that is money. Um, and I won't read it all out, but basically the contradiction is this, and the two branches of the contradiction I put in different colors. Uh, that for something to be money, it has to be possessed, obviously, well, by an individual or a group. But also, if something is to be money, it has to be spent, otherwise it's not money. But if it's being possessed, it's not being spent. And if it's being spent, it's not being possessed. That's the basic contradiction underlying what Marx is saying in this passage. But he, um, he puts it rather brilliantly. I can really, right at the bottom, I can really posit its being for myself only by giving it up as mere being for others. If I want to cling to it, it evaporates in my hand to become a mere phantom of real wealth. Elsewhere, he calls it. Um, money, a pure abstraction, uh, uh, only in my head, a pure fantasy. So, so if it's not in circulation, if it's hoarded, it's just an abstraction. Uh, it's not doing anything. If it's in circulation, then it has material um, being, but it's not possessed. Okay, now in the critique, contribution to the critique of political economy. He, he uh, writes and 
somewhat more imaginative way on the same theme. The hoarder of money scorns the worldly, temporal, and ephemeral enjoyments in order to chase after the eternal treasure, which can be touched neither by moths or rust, which is wholly celestial and wholly mundane. So he's here aligning the hoard with the imperishable, but also abstract or fantasy. And money being spent as perishable because, oh, it perishes, you no longer have it. Um, and this is, I think, crucial for understanding the difference between Heraclitus and Parmenides. And um, I should say, I won't go again too much into the detail of that, but here a little bit of history and attention to further fragments of Heraclitus and Parmenides. Parmenides was said to be a wealthy aristocrat. Heraclitus uh, was said to have given up the kingship, uh, which is a purely ceremonial one. Um, and Heraclitus stresses the communality of what he calls the logos. The logos can mean, at this time, a monetary account, but it means in Heraclitus sometimes at least a mathematical formula or a proportion. It turned up in Jennifer's uh, presentation this morning, meaning an account, a monetary account. Well, there it is in Heraclitus, there's a logos, which rules everything. Everything happens according to the logos. Incidentally, this is, this is in a sense, an attempt to solve the problem that Arist Aristotle was unsuccessfully trying to solve 200 years later when he said, what is it that makes an equivalence between commodities? How, how is this possible? Uh, and this is, I think, what Euclides is concerned with, except for him, he's not giving uh, a sort of sensible uh, explanation. He's saying, well, it's the logos, which can mean a mathematical pro proportion. But there it is, it's the center of the world, it's impersonal, and it controls everything. And it means proportion, namely the proportion which is absolutely central to all commercial transactions, which are themselves central to the life of the city state. So, for Clytus, the logos is communal, it's xunos. He says this wonderful fragment. That's why Heraclitus still lives. He says, that the logos being communal, um, people live as if they have private understanding. I mean, this is as true today as it ever was. <coughs> Whereas Parmenides is a wealthy aristocrat. In his poem, he, he is the only person to whom his wisdom is revealed. He calls himself as having gone far from the paths of men to get this individual revelation from the goddess, which is his metaphysics. So Heraclitus represents the communality of circulation and Parmenides represents the individuality of possession. So all this fits together, these two opposed. We, we don't think like this about these two essences of money, but the more I think about it, the more important it is to understand that about money, even were it not the case that it's absolutely crucial for understanding ancient philosophy. And of course, Plato is also an aristocrat and the Parmenidean tradition win out. Now, one or two more little details about Parmenides, just for examples of how the hypothesis can explain uh, stuff that I wasn't expecting to. You can see in front of you part of Parmenides' argument about how it is that all that exists is one unchanging abstract and so on. Incidentally, the pre Socratic scholars love Parmenides because they think he's the first person to reduce a philosophical argument deduction. They love him. Uh, Aristotle, on the other hand, said that his conclusions were almost insane. Uh, he says that, which is true. Uh, of course, the, his conclusions are not the result of de deduction. I mean, you could say if he thinks that all change, diversity is an illusion, then there's something badly wrong with his deduction. But it's not about deduction. And there is deduction, which is abstract. And um, what's central about Parmenides is the power of abstraction, but um, the preconceptions, 
but the preconceptions must be socially derived. I mean, where else can they come from? Anyway, um, here you've got part of the argument for the idea that everything is one thing, abstract and unchanging. And it, uh, it's also an eternal. All these things can be related to money. What debt Creos would have impelled it later or earlier to spring up if it began from nothing? So you see, the world, the one, couldn't have begun from nothing because, well, what would have caused it to come into being? So it's eternal. It's the kind of argument that's used by other philosophers as well. But he says what Creos, which means debt, Virtually all the translators of this say, what necessity? Because that's common sense. I mean, it makes no sense at all to say what debt would have impelled it. But that's what it says. That is what it says. And I won't bore you with my paragraph or two in which I carefully examine the use of the word kreos, um, that there's no way around it. So if you're faced, with the inevitable fact that Amenides has said what debt has caused us to come into being, either you um, give up completely or you change your perspective. And then if you change your perspective, it might make sense. From my perspective, it makes perfect sense because the one is uh, a cosmization of abstract being, namely monetary value or monetary substance, which is, which is debt free. Part of the ideology of the aristocrat, of course, is to be debt free, to imagine money completely divorced from circulation. Because it's not that just that Heraclitus and Parmenides are alighting on opposite aspects of money. No, there's a strong ideological content here. Um, and as I said, the ancient wealthy were not capitalists, they were hoarders. Um, uh, they had treasure, as Marx describes them. And that treasure he calls celestial. Um, and it is, so the wealth has to be divorced from circulation. Uh, so that even they conceive, conceive of no relation of it to circulation. Plato has a wonderful passage in the Republic where he's talking about the education of the guardians. Um, and he says, they must be told that they have divine and silver currency in their soul. That relates to what I was saying earlier about how the inner self is constructed out of money. By the way, it's almost impossible to persuade people of this. This is such an unpleasant idea that your inner soul, or at least the Greek's inner soul, is influenced by the idea of money. Um, but Plato says that, and then he says, <clears throat> and that divine and silver currency is quite different from the polluting money used by the multitude. So for Plato, there are two kinds of money. There's the divine money in the same philosophers, good, and the polluting money used by the multitude, bad. That's my difference between possession and circulation. But the possession is sublimated, and the circulation is still there, uh, being polluting. Okay, so... <clears throat> Parmenides is one, is debt free. Now, we go on to what he says. Uh, yes, I, well, I put this in here simply because um, <clears throat> Anaximander has a similar word, kreon, according to necessity. That word creon can mean necessity, it can also mean debt. Uh, and what I'm saying here is that the notion of, of, of cosmic necessity, which you don't find in Homer, you find it first in philosophy, derives from the idea of debt. But it's generalized. Um, and uh, so there it is in the next amendment. When you get to Heraclitus, um, well, he says war is communal and justice is strife, and all things happen according to strife and necessity. The pre Socratic philosophers can make no sense of this at all. War is communal, and justice is strife. What are you talking about? So they just refer to it as sort of odd. But all things happen according to strife and necessity. Okay, things happen according to strife and necessity. Why is justice strife? Um, on my hypothesis, once again, it makes perfect sense. 
And I've come recently to realize how important it is to understand. In fact, um, I'm still not entirely convinced of this. But Heraclitus envisages the world not just as a process in which the one thing in which the world is composed, fire, is constantly being transformed from and into everything else. He also regards the world as pervaded by unities of opposites, up, down, hot, cold, summer, winter, or the opposing uh, directions in which you pull the string and work by lyre, and so on. So he gives many examples of opposites, but you get the sense that Heraclitus has come on as a tissue on various units of well, why? Why come up with, I mean, not many, opposites do remain not unimportant in philosophy, but nobody thinks that the whole world is composed of unique opposites. On my hypothesis that Heraclitus's circulation of fire is a cosmization of monetary circulation makes perfect sense because each commercial transaction is a unity of opposites. Now, again, that sounds very odd to us, partly because we, we take commercial transactions for granted, but in Homer, um, they didn't. And there are one or two commercial transactions, very interesting, I won't get into them now, but what do I mean by saying a commercial transaction is a unit of opposites? In a commercial transaction, both sides are trying to get as much for themselves as possible, obviously in theory at least, um, and nevertheless, they come to a perfect agreement. It's a perfect unit. A commercial transaction is a perfect unity, and it's a perfect opposition. It's both at once. And short for me, this is at least an explanation of why Heraclitus thought the world was composed of the unity of opposites. Now, you may not like the explanation, but I don't know a better one, I mean, of course, say, well, just look at the summer, winter, all the rest of it. The world does have opposites in it, but it had had opposites in it forever. And he's the first person to come up with this idea. So why then and there? Could it be um, something to do with the fact that it's that's commercialized, monetized in society and history? Okay, so that's why justice is strife, because in justice you get, as Aristotle says, this this, this uh, unity, this equivalence and unity in exchange. But it's strife simply because, well, they have opposed interests. They're each trying to get as much for themselves, as little for the other person as possible. So suddenly this fragment makes perfect sense. And there are many other examples of this sort of thing. Now here's part, back to Parmenides. When Parmenides has this long passage that survived in which he describes his one abstract, eternal, unchanging what? And uh, he's <clears throat> rather surprising uh, the detail in which he describes it. Justice doth not loose her fetters and let anything come into being or pass away, but holds it fast. So it, it, it's unchanging, unmoving, because he's got justice holding it fast. Hard necessity keeps it in the bonds of the limit that holds it fast on every side. Um, <clears throat> Wherefore, it is not permitted to what is to be unbounded for. It is in need of nothing, has no need. <coughs> imagine, this, this is, imagine this is a hoard of money. <coughs> as treasure. Justice ensures that Parmenides keeps his treasure. Um, but treasure is in need of nothing, don't have to spend it. Because if you did spend it, if it were unbounded, it would stand in need of everything. It would enter the circulation, and that would mean it would be in need of everything. It would enter this indiscriminate world of exchange, exchange being based on need. Um, fate, Moira has changed it. Moira means um, fate, is, but it, it means fate because originally it means distribution. It's an economic concept. And then, nor can all that is... <clears throat> nor can all that is be more here and less there than what is, since it is all inviolable. Asylon, inviolable. Sulo means to plunder. Asylon means not to be plundered. Okay, so here's this abstract one. Why is it inviolable? Nobody, I mean, people don't even ask this question. 
what they would say here would be, ah, it's a metaphor. Now, metaphor is one of those words like um, I know, ambiguity or irony, which sort of we tend to be cut off thought. Right? Ambiguity is irony, it's a metaphor, end of investigation. No, this isn't a metaphor. If it is a metaphor, what is it a metaphor for? Something other than inviolability, in which case it isn't a metaphor, but if it is something other than inviolability, what is it? Uh, we, we, um, of course, it's inviolable because this is a projection of property of Parmenides' hoard, which he, wrote, he wants to be inviolable and imagines to be inviolable. Right, now, here's Lloyd again, whom I've already spoken of, I'm afraid, rather disparagingly. He says, uh, we have no, but he does, he does deal with this question of metaphor. He says, we have no reason to believe that any of the Greek philosophers simply conflated society and nature. It is often the case that the cosmological doctrines of the pre-Socratics appear to consist of nothing but a concrete image. Well, we have no reason to believe that, why have we got no reason to believe that the Greek philosophers simply conflated society and nature? That word simply is sort of weasel word, isn't it? Um, Simply, yeah, okay. Well, it was, well, there's nothing simple about it, that's true. But they still, obviously, they were conflating society and nature. What is he talking about? Then he says, giving the game away, sometimes all the cosmological doctrine is is an image, nothing else. Well, if it's an image, it's like saying it's a metaphor. What is it an image of? It doesn't say. So when it comes to an axiomanda, say, uh, uh, that's, um, Remember, he, the next Amanda says that the um, opposites are giving each other, paying each other penalty according to justice and disposition of time. So, okay, right. So is that conflation of society and nature? Well, of course it is. Not for Lloyd. For Lloyd, it's an image. Image of what? Well, justice and paying penalties. It's an image of, of the sun coming up and going down and things changing. So you we're being asked to believe that an Amanda's contribution to the human race was to compare the sun going up and down to the presence of justice. It was pathetic. No, I mean, you wouldn't be known as a philosopher just for finding an image to describe natural processes like that. No, what he's saying, this is the embodiment of justice. What you're seeing here is a process in which justice, which is in human affairs, is embodied in the human. It's, it's called cosmization. And um, I'll come on to cosmization shortly because it is a problematic concept. So, so metaphor is one of the means by which uh, pre-Socratic scholars shield themselves from understanding what seem to me to be obvious truths. Now I'm gonna deal with the criticisms of my thesis to end my talk. And this is by a chap very recently published called Nick Molinari and uh, it's much better to be critiqued than to be ignored. And he devotes a whole chapter to attacking my views. And he, it's, a, it's, a, it's a Catholic perspective. He's very respectful, um, but he, he regards this as a very important issue because he, he actually says he's defending uh, God and the soul from my account. And no, Nick, I mean, I'm not, I'm not trying to persuade you that God and the soul don't exist. What I am doing is trying to show you that certain conceptions of God and the soul are historically determined, which of course they are. Uh, anyway, so for him, the stakes are very high. Um, and he says something which is sometimes said to me, which is basically this, okay, you've said that there's a certain kind of abstract being or abstract thinking arises from monetization, but how do you know it wasn't the other way around? How do you know it wasn't the case that first people had the abstract thinking or the notion of abstract being? As a result of that, they were able to develop coins. And uh, so he puts this by saying the creator of coinage must first have had the idea for coinage. Where did this idea come from? The exchange of commodities in the intuitive notion of abstract human labor a la Marx is the indication from the opening of Seifert's work. Actually, um, I, I deliberately say at my opening, I'm not going to deal with the question of the labor theory of value or labor at all. But that's what he says. But again, the philosophical prepossession 
presupposition involved in this view are entirely ignored because Seaford is explaining the world from the world. <clears throat> I should apologize, of course, for my croaky voice, which has been a bit of a handicap for this lecture. I don't always have it. Uh, but one could just as easily suggest transcendental forms as an explanation as the source of knowledge and value. Okay, so he said, where did this idea come from? The idea of coinage. I, of course, my obvious reply is, okay, but where do, where do the transcendental forms come from? He doesn't seem to think that requires explanation. What I say to this kind of objection, which is a reasonable objection, is that I can construct a very good account. I have constructed an account in my book of the practical processes and historical circumstances which produce coinage. You know, whether it's a surplus of electrum, the need to put a stamp on because of varying value of the metal, a whole set of historical circumstances centered on the polis, which produce coinage. I can think of no explanation other than the coinage one of why the Greeks suddenly produced this revolutionary thought. I can think of no, no explanation. And all he can talk about is transcendental forms. So where do they come from? So I have a perfectly good explanation of how coinage came to be and then produced abstract thinking. Nobody can ever explain how abstract thought for some reason came into being and then produced coinage. So that's roughly speaking my answer to this kind of criticism. It's not a knockdown argument, but it establishes, I think, along with everything else, a high probability. Another kind of criticism I've suffered is the weakness of my notion of projection or cosmic projection. Now, I don't actually, I've given up using the word projection because it has all the wrong associations with Feuerbach, for example, with Freud and Nietzsche. Um, so I use the word cosmization instead. And this is a rather rare word and an under-theorized topic. It's developed by the sociologist Peter Berger, uh, quite interestingly, and I'm usually in a very similar sense the way he uses it in sociologist of religion. Um, he says that it was invented by Mercha Eliade. I don't know whether he's still well known in this country. I mean, he lived here a long time. The pop a popular writer on comparative religion. Uh, now, Eliade actually. He does use the word cosmization, but he uses it <coughs> not in the sense which Berger claims he uses it. He uses it to mean the bringing of a terrestrial phenomenon in relation to a celestial phenomenon. The celestial phenomenon pre exists. You bring your terrestrial phenomenon, it might be a ritual, an institution, a temple, in relation to a pre existing celestial phenomenon, you know, the ritual actions of the gods the divine temple, the divine monarchy, whatever it is. He says, he goes through his book, giving endless examples of how, as he puts it, human beings construct um, archetypes. But curiously, he never says that human beings construct archetypes. They just construct things on the basis of archetypes. So like Molinari in his Transcendent Forms, you're left wondering where the archetypes come from. There's a sort of political issue here because, um, I accused Lloyd of, of, of bourgeois conceptions of freedom. Um, and, <clears throat> but Eliade was a supporter in the 20s and 30s of the Christian fascist party, the Iron Guard in Romania. I was, of course, criticized for that. I'm going to spend a little more time on Eliade because um, he's not a great intellect. But he's an interesting phenomenon. He's a very learned, very articulate, and extreme exponent of a kind of view that's actually quite common in relation to archetypes and their, rela their relation to human activity. And here he says, with candor, um, it is useless to search archaic languages for the terms so laboriously created by the great philosophical traditions. There is every likelihood that such words as being, non-being, real, unreal, becoming, illusory, are not found in the language of the Australians or the ancient Mesopotamians. Well, that's true. But, he says, if the word is lacking, the thing is present. No, wrong. If the word is lacking, 
well, abstract being, or just the word being, what is the being of being? Um, if you don't have the language for it, you don't have the phenomenon. Uh, at least, or you only have it in a very limited sense, which is not what the sense that he means. Uh, so uh, the Australians didn't think about abstract being or even being. Um, and that's what concerns us. We're concerned here with what human beings are thinking. Uh, what he's doing is uh, seeing the whole primitive culture through the lens of Platonism. Objects or acts acquire a value, and in doing so, become real because they participate in one fashion or another in a reality that transcends them. Among countless stones, one stone becomes sacred and hence instantly becomes saturated with being. The object appears as the receptacle of an exterior force that differentiates it from its milieu and gives it meaning and value. Plato could be regarded as the outstanding philosopher of primitive mentality. Plato talks about abstract being and the fundamental uh, opposition between being and seeming of participating in being and all the rest of it, because he is, he is expressing a recently monetized society. In pre-monetary societies, they just don't think in these abstract terms. They just don't, and he knows it, he already knows it. Nevertheless, because he has no sense of history, he is seeing them through this Platonist lens, which is all about being and participating in being and being saturated with being. Even a stone is saturated with being. Slightly ludicrous idea. But let's follow it through a little bit because what he says here, which is of value, is that the object appears as the receptacle of an exterior force that differentiates it from its milieu and gives it meaning and value. Okay, what is this exterior force? Um, well, let's take the stone, the sacred stone, the object of cult, uh, which is pervaded by an exterior force, um, or the receptacle of an exterior force. Why is it receptacle of an exterior force? Well, the stone is sacred by virtue of being the object, the focus of human attention. Unlike the other stones, this stone is the object of human attention. A lot of people are focused on it. Um, but it's a mere stone. So that some force is involved here, which is separate from the stone, the plus personal force, which is bringing everybody together, coordinating the group, so they're all focusing on this stone, is coordinating transpersonal force, is clearly not simply inhering in the stone, or he's not only inhering in the stone, he's an exterior force. So this is true. I mean, right, I put it all very crudely, but that's, he's right about that. This has got nothing to do with being. This is a process, a ritual process. Now, <clears throat> let us think of, of um, coordinating entities more sophisticated than a stone, like a ritual or a temple or a monarchy or a social institution. They are coordinating entities uh, which um, seem to exercise a force, or do exercise a force on the group, bring them together. Um, and if they're complex entities, then they may well themselves appear uh, as exterior, radically exterior to the people whom they are coordinated. Um, this involves the question of transcendence, which he talks about, the reality that transcends it. Because it's very important to define transcendence. I define transcendence as comprehensive power from beyond, that's all. Um, transcendental is a bit different, but, but uh, comprehensive power from beyond. Now, this exterior force can appear as a comprehensive power from beyond. So, monarchy clearly is a, is is um, transcendent in the sense it's a power is comprehensive, and for most people, it is beyond. So, mon a monarchy is what you might call socially transcendent. But the point is that what is socially transcendent can always be projected as um, metaphysically transcendent. Uh, and uh, this is what is the process of cosmization when the socially transcendent is imagined as the metaphysically transcendent. Um, I thought I had a, oh, here we are, yeah. Why did I miss that? 
my last slide. Uh, this is just an example of how colonization works. Um, this is Sennacherib's annals, uh, which he, inscriptions that he put up. The Assyrian kings were not famous for their modesty. This is the, the Donald Trump of his era. Sennacherib, the great king, king of the universe, king of Assyria, favorite of the great gods. The interesting point is here is that he's king of the of Syria, but he's also king of the universe. If you're king of Assyria, yes, you're king of the universe. <laughs> this is a very simple example of cosmization. Well, Zeus, Zeus is a monarch uh, who's clearly the result of cosmization of a monarch, and he legitimates the king Agamemnon by giving his ancestors a scepter. And the Sennacherib, you can see, it's sort of the same thing from the other direction. Um, I am the king of Syria, so I'm king of the universe. Uh, now, of course, that cosmization can be accepted by his subjects. So it's not just the power moves, it's, it's also it would be a matter of general acceptance. As Syrians would accept that Assyria, they're being ruled by the king of the universe, whom they can glimpse occasionally. And um, there's also, of course, uh, an issue not so much of power, but of knowledge in the sense that the cosmos is unknown. You can only imagine the totality of the cosmos in terms of the totality of the social order. And that clearly is a, um, at least before the development of um, telescopes, microscopes, scientific method, the application of mathematics and science, and so on. I mean, that, that passage of Anaximander that I showed you more than once. That view of the world is the result neither of observation, nor of experimentation, nor of common sense. None of those three things produce the conception of the world as, as, as things paying the penalty to each other. It, of course, is the cosmization of the central process of the polis. That's what it is. Um, so we have then uh, <clears throat> money as, like the monarchy, uh, or even that humble stone, a entity of coordination, generally accepted. Um, and uh, in, in the case of money, unusually comprehensive. Money has the further characteristic which qualifies it for very easy uh, cosmization, which is in order to function as money, it has to be entirely detached from all persons and all other things. It is so generous, it is distinct. It is entirely abstract. The coins aren't abstract, but the value that they embody is abstract. And therefore it is already removed from all particulars, whether it's particular people, particular things. So already even on this earth, it is uh, superhuman and comprehensive and transcendent, definitely socially transcendent. And what I've been saying is that social transcendent is easily transformed into or becomes um, um, metaphysical transcendent. I'll make one more point which relates to what I was saying earlier, but these philosophers have been quite unlike the people that Joel was talking about. Um, crucial to all of this is that these are the first people really who, who thought that the world was not run by persons, namely God, superhuman persons. Uh, so how is that possible? How is that revolution they thought possible? Well, Heraclitus, Xenophanes, uh, uh, Anaximander, and Parmenides, these were almost certainly individuals who, were, who had money, but were not engaged in ideological reproduction of the Egyptian monarchy, um, as it were. I mean, they, they, were, they were intellectuals and they were wealthy, but they were, they were <clears throat> in mere citizens. And they're certainly not engaged in financial administration. And for somebody like Xenophanes, or Heraclitus, or Parmenides, the fact is that your source of power, money, is far more effective as a source of power than the gods in the local temple. It's very simple, but it, it, it only occurred to me very recently that they are in a situation where money will get them everything they want. 
But the gods, frankly, are pretty useless at doing that. Uh, it's that kind of consideration, which is one of the pressures which produces this revolution in thought. Uh, okay, well, I'll stop there. Thank you for listening. So I'm, uh, I've, I've already answered all the possible objections. Uh, <laughs> Yeah. Well, it is safe. Like every, like most people here, and probably more than most, I know rather little about archaic Greece. But uh, you know, it's the Parmenides. I was thinking with, with Parmenides, uh, a characterization of the one as asulon, as as, as unassailable or un, un, unlootable. Um, I, it occurred to me, yeah, but, but one way to think about that is right that, that this is sort of a projection of what he wants his own possession to be, but maybe it would work a little bit better as a characterization of a temple treasury. Yes, I, I mean, it, it would have from looting by both strong walls and taboo. Uh, as a, and of course, there's the two could be going on at once that he's yeah. sort of motivated both by his own experience as a hoarder, but also by. The, the role of temple treasuries in uh, in the society at the time. Yes, indeed. I mean, the, the temple treasury is just a further example of how in the ancient world, if you're going to preserve your wealth, you needed strong measures. You needed a thick wall and so on and so forth. I mean, there's lots of stories about you know, these people keeping their gold under their beds. And this, the Athenian orators give you many examples of how people store gold and silver in the house. And... Uh, the treasury, yes. I mean, I, do, I don't think it matters philosophically that it could be the treasury. But it's an example of how um, probably Asylon was applied more frequently to a temple than to an individual. An individual um, storehouse. So it's rather a grand word for him to use. But because it, it means not to be plundered. Now, plunder is quite a serious collective undertaking. I, yeah. I, recall, I recall seeing at one point that I... Archeal, and I don't know what, again, I don't know how up to date this is, but that uh, the, the lion status, I'm sure it's on the very earliest mm -hmm. identifiable coins, are associated archaeologically mainly with the Temple of Artemis at Ephesus. Oh, yes, yes. I mean, in the earliest coins, or some of the earliest coins, are discovered in the Temple of Artemis at Ephesus. And as I was saying, previous session, temples are repositories for the wealth of the community. And that that could indeed include coins. But I can also imagine this sort of like being a, a conceptual stepping stone from the gods as rulers of the universe to, to cash ruling everything around. Yes, them. yes, yes. <laughs> yes, exactly. Well, thank you for that. Um, the the uh, predicates of Parmenides one, there are six or seven, there are six, I think, predicates that he attributes to the one. And, and you've, you've, you've I think convincingly pointed to a few terms that seem motivated by money. What about the indivisibility of the one? If if one of the traits of coinage is its divisibility? Yes, um, I, I I deal with that point somewhere. I'm trying to remember what my my uh, response was. I think I think the point about divisibility. This is what he was. The whole about the divisibility of money is only needed in exchange, in circulation. If you're buying stuff, money needs to be divisible. If you're hoarding stuff, not only is it indivisibility not needed, but it might be a point of honor to think of it as indivisible because that's a further expression of its separation from circulation. So at best, divisibility or indivisibility is irrelevant if it's hoarded. Um, so what? does he have a big lump of gold? Is he pre-coining? Is he like somehow somehow the 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 somehow the plurality of coinage seems fundamental to coinage? Yeah, it does, but only for, only in circulation. I mean, if if you are hoarding stuff, um, then you, it doesn't matter whether it's plural or not. 
I mean, it's just. But then that conception doesn't need mod, hasn't much to do with monetization. It would be just a wealth, wealth. Yes, yes, what, well, indeed. But what does have to do with monetization is that it's abstract. It's abstract as well as being one. And the, uh, uh, abstraction is <clears throat> homogeneous and homo homogeneity is on the way to being indivisible, if you say it. I mean, it isn't, but, but something that's homogeneous um, doesn't have internal divisions. So it's, it's sort of like being indivisible. And abstract value is homogeneous. So there is a conceptual path from the abstraction of monetary value to homogeneity, to indivisibility. But of course, it's all completely upset if you if you have to spend it, because you spend parts of it. So I take your point, but but um, I think it's a, I can accommodate it in this conception of what Parmenides is saying. And indeed, I mean, when when he says well, it's limited, because if it was unlimited, if, if you didn't have this limit, it, it, it would it would be um, Unlimited. Uh, that's a pretty odd thing to say. If it didn't have those particular bounds, it would be unlimited. Why would it be unlimited? Simply because it's entering circulation. Circulation is unlimited. The unlimited maximum. But possessions are limited, even though you've got a lot of them. Still, your possessions have a limit. And the limit faces outwards and inwards. It faces. Um, Outwards, because you're keeping people away from it. It's asylum. Um, and it's facing inwards because you're not spending it. It's not going into the circulation. That's why he emphasizes the limit so much. So just about everything he says about it can be related to money, I think. Yeah. Um, this is a slightly off topic because it's a little bit further in history, but I, I want to invite you to make some connections. Um, I've always been struck by the fact that book one of the Republic starts with uh, Cephalus talking about when they when they stop joking around and they're like, all right, what's justice? The very first definition is uh, being honest, repaying one's debts. And they ask Cephalus what the good of money is. And that's not about buying whatever the equivalent of Gaudis was back in the day, but paying one's debts. So um, I take it from your reading of Parmenides that this is uh should be totally expected is like the starting point that Plato would begin with for beginning to uh, philosophize about justice. Is that right? Are there other interesting connections to draw between where Republic starts and the stuff that you're interested in? Yeah, I mean, friends? it's interesting that we do possess Plato's will preserved by Diogenes Laertius. And there's no reason to suppose it's a forger or anything. And he has. And this is consonant with what I was saying about the ancient economy. He doesn't have uh, any shares in general electric. He has two farms. He has four or five slaves. He has a kind of gold and silver. And he has no debts. That's mm. actually specified, no debts. So to have debts would not be consonant with that aristocratic self-sufficiency, um, which means you don't have to work and you don't even have to be involved in financial administration, you get slaves to do that. Um, but as for the Republic, yes, I mean, I hadn't thought about that, but I, maybe it's too subtle, but it's interesting to think about. Uh, and because some people think that nothing in these opening bits of Plato's dialogues are arbitrary. Right? I mean, it's, it's the Strassians, for example, they, they have a, all this stuff is supposed to be uh, significant. Um, Um, two things that uh, uh, the very book uh, has, has you identify yourself now as a historian, right? Not just a classicist or. Uh, well, that's what you mean by classicist. I certainly call myself a historian. Yeah. But what, I'm, what I'm saying is that that point that you made it at the very beginning. Once see something once you it's not it's tested constantly I mean, what you're saying is very big what you've said today is very big stuff but it's not like you haven't tested each of these points and actually seen that they not only seem 
to make sense in particular cases, but they begin to answer questions that A, that people haven't been asking, and B, that you've been asking, and they seem to answer more questions than you ever actually even yeah, yeah. So I just, I mean, there's something that, uh, there's some, you know, if, I, I mean, I really admire your confidence. As I fall over the cliff. I think it's justified. I think it's really justified. Um, but, but, it's, but it's very interesting because but I think it's, it's, the people in here are saying, well, that's just a lot of things put together, but it, it all hangs together as far as I can. And I can see how it begins to for you um, that you can only answer in this way. The one, the one specific question I'd like to ask you is, if you could speak a bit more about the connection between monetization and the emergence of the abstract being in abstract terms. Uh, you've already spoken in your talk, your answer, but this is a huge point. And I, I just wonder if you could just fill that out a little bit. Yes, um, by the way, this point is about your, your opening point. What I'm doing is just a sample. I mean, the masses of mutants of this kind, which in my view are important to place, given this hypothesis. And some of them are in my book, some of them I've discovered later. But I've published in the um, As for the general the relationship between money and abstraction, there has to be a bit careful. I mean, abstract terms predate monetization. I mean, typical money language without any abstractions. Abstracting is what human beings do. There are certain, certain key notions like abstract being and logic, actually, which, which clearly have a relation to monetization. But reason doesn't. I mean, um, uh, people talk about the Amenides and early Greek philosophy as the birth of reason. And no. Um, Hunter gatherers have reason, you know. I mean, reason that this branch has been broken, there must have been a dinosaur. Um, I mean, yeah, there's plenty of reasoning going on in, 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 in pre monetary societies, even hunter gatherer society. The difference is the level of abstraction, right? Parmenides reasons, and it's not as if he's discovered reason as what philosophers think. But that he's applying to his thought process a, le a level of abstraction which has been applied before. And where does that level of abstraction come from? It's there also in his conclusion that everything is abstract. So it's there in his conclusion, but it also informs his method. But philosophers think, well, this for some reason, the Greek genius, they've discovered reason. And this is the first example. I mean, Lloyd thinks that it was about reason. Well, that's just freedom, there's reason. And no, I mean, there must be reason. Uh, you can define reason in such a way. Greeks are the first people to use reason, but in doing so, you can't really avoid the notion of abstraction. I mean, logic, the rules of formal logic, are a kind of what you might call good sense set out in a series of rules which are generalized and, and divested of all particularities and all concrete uh, detail. That is to say, they're abstract, right? Aristotle's rules of logic, the first person to produce systematic rules of logic, is informed by abstraction. It is possible because of abstraction, not because he's discovered this thing called reason. Incidentally, this word logos, of course, comes to mean reason. It originally meant a monetary account. In Heraclitus, it means a mathematical proportion. Then in Plato, it's come to mean something like reason. So even reason, even the word for reason, has this really interesting history in money. So I'm not sure I've answered your question. Really, but I should, uh, I'll talk to you further about it. Okay, good. But one other thing, one last thing at that point I'd like to make is how productive your questions are, the way you're asking questions that other people haven't asked, and in a, in a deeply serious way, and, and you follow, you just follow what, you do whatever you can to, to, to find an answer that makes sense. And then if you see, if it fits in one case, if it doesn't fit in another case, well then you might even 
or that, but if it fits in that case too, and then in another case. So I, it's just the questions that I, I, I really connect with you on the, that idea. Well, why, why do they do this? Why are they doing this? Why are they thinking this way? Why are they, why are they speculating uh, in these? Where did they come from? Where did they get the optimism? Okay. Kind of stuff. Very exciting to see to see uh, some to see you working things out the way you do. Yeah, thanks. Really by the way, I, I can go over this stuff all night. So you may have to tell me to stop at some point. But, but uh, this more speculative question. So, I mean, I understand the argument that um, monetization produces a certain kind of abstraction that now becomes possible, a certain level of abstraction. And then you, that's the argument. But is this argument specifically for this moment of changing in a level of abstraction with Greek thinkers, or would you say that then in a subsequent history of abstraction in the West, that any account for understanding a kind of fundamental change in the power of abstraction would also have to repeat the similar kind of arguments? What I'm thinking here is people who argue that, look, with the development of early modern mathematics and you know natural sciences, there's also a kind of comparable shift in the power of abstraction. So the power of abstraction that now becomes deployed in Galileo, Newton, et cetera, yeah. is fundamentally different than the kind of abstraction that was deployed in Greek yeah. philosophy. <clears throat> and that then sets up then a, a, a transformation in, in, in thinking. So would you say that one would have to sort of run the same kind of analysis that you're producing for the Greeks for the early moderns? Would we have to do the same thing for monotheism? Because there's a similar kind of argument that with monotheism, there's a fundamentally different kind of abstraction conceptually that produces, for example, the conception of nothingness, right? God is nothing. Yeah, yeah. And that's a kind of abstraction. So are you, so is this a specific argument about Greece or is it, let's call it a philosophical argument that any time in the history of abstraction, there is a fundamental shift of abstraction. And the story that one has to tell to explain that must include, among other things, monetization or, or some account of monetization. Okay. Yes, I mean, I'm, I'm working on monotheism now in collaboration with the Hebrew Bible scholar, comparing the origins of Greek monotheism and the origins of Hebrew monotheism. The answer to your question is that whole area is very interesting. I'm predisposed to answer your question, yes, that the same kind of method is relevant for later periods. But it's far too big a question for me to have any um, views on. However, let, take, for example, Descartes as a simple example of the sort of thing that intrigues me. I'm not, I'm not coming up with any great theory here, but, but just a sort of thing that catches my eye. Cogito ergo sum. I mean, that, that's inconceivable in the ancient world. Yeah. I mean, the idea that the existence of the eye is the only thing that can be sure um, No, I mean, the fact is you've got a, Plato, you've got a suke, that suke has a kinship with the outside world. That, that kind of solipsism is just inconceivable in the ancient world. If you, if you perhaps you shouldn't call it solipsism, but whatever you call it, the reduction of everything to the simple content-free eye. Descartes inherited land, which he sold, lived off the rent, traveled around Europe, living off the rent. Nobody in the ancient world did that. I mean, <coughs> they had landed estates, Plato would have lived on his landed estate. Um, the idea of, and Descartes is a rentier, one of the very first of the professional life, going here and there and always being supported by the rent of his paternal estates, which he sold for that purpose, right? Now, there's an interesting possibility in connecting this new conception of the reduced eye to an economic situation in which, in which, um, uh, in which he is entirely dependent on not land, not, not, not even a treasure house, but uh, rent, a source of money, what he's put into the market. Right? I mean, he's, he's engaging in a sort of market transaction like extracting rent uh, and being well aware of it. However, let me emphasize, of course, that 
and maybe nothing to do that, but that's the sort of thing if I had many lives, I would follow up. But I mean, the obvious re response to that is, of course, I mean, textually, of course, the, the term cogito ego sum comes from uh, Augustine, from De Trinitate, already deployed there. And what... Yeah, yeah, but it means, it means something different. Well, it means something comparable. I mean, the, the certainty, I mean, not, not just, so the certainty of the I is only true in the moment of utterance and therefore dependent on it being always true, which requires a relationship to God. So that's sure, why okay. the yeah. argument of the meditations, the cogito then allows to discover the idea of God, third meditation, and it's only through the idea of God and the relationship between the ego, the cogito and God, that then it all becomes stabilized. So this would be yeah. an argument where just to put pressure, the, 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 the analogy or the appeal to land and stuff like that doesn't allow us to philosophically make sense of the way in which the cogito is deployed as an argument. Well, and then yeah. furthermore, you can say there's a kind of a complex debate that he's having with Augustine, because Augustine, it's not the same, but Augustine also has the same thing. The inner man is discovered through the reduction from the outer man and yeah. then light of transcendence towards God. So this is just to show the, the complexity of mounting the kind of reading you want. Yeah, but it's, it's not as if Augustine is saying the only thing you can be certain of is that I exist. Yeah, but that's an inconceivable, that's an inconceivable. That's 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 because it's only in the moment of utterance that it's true, but he wants to establish it as a principle that in every idea that's clear and distinct, and for that he then needs God. So that's why it's not, it's, it's about transcendence of ego to God, the third- In Augustine. Day. In Descartes. Descartes. Yeah. Okay, I mean, I'm always told that Descartes uh, is intellectually illiterate. I didn't know about what you said about Augustine, but I believe that Descartes was intellectually innovative. I don't really want to press this point, because yeah. as, I, as I said, I know far too little about it. But, but in response, yes, any, yes. Argument that any, any argument of this kind would have to precisely take into account the kind of consideration you interestingly provided. Of course it would. Um, but never, nevertheless, it's just an example in response to what you were saying, an example of, of how things can catch one's eye without one having the time to develop them. I mean, uh, so that, that, that if there is an international revolution, take a cut. Uh, I'm sort of committed to the view that there's something else going on rather than just the development of the internet. Huh? Well, I want to say that the, some of the stuff that I was talking about yesterday with the idea of the Iranian idea that every every thing in the world can be reduced to uh, magnitude, uh, that's that's one of these great gains in abstraction. And and I do think I can make a case in that case that there is some, some connection. Not that I'd ever thought of the, this particular point before, but I could see it. Um, perhaps you, if you remember what you know, that whole idea of the geometry of qualities, it's an extraordinary abstraction. And, um, well. The, the reduction of, of uh, what you might call quality to quantity, uh, we have it in English universities, we call it the surface <laughs> <laughs> still going on. The, uh, it starts with Alex Uni, who who says, well, everything is air, and what you see around you is all these various things. It's just more or less compression of the air, right? So that wood is air very compressed, but it's the same thing. So the degree of compression is, a, is a, in effect a quantitative measure. And it's producing this qualitative difference. And so, but I can't imagine that, that anybody said anything like that in, in Mesopotamia or Egypt, right? I mean, this is, this is new. About how money reduces the qualitative to the quantitative. Hmm. Uh, I just have a, uh, a comment, although I don't. Uh, I know that you don't need my help in sort of defending yourselves against your critics. Uh, a comment on on the that there was a mentioning of Marx and the and the hen and the egg problem about you know does the thought of money come first or money or rather would wouldn't they have the have the abstraction? And in that quote. I think it's a it's a complete misreading misunderstanding of what Marx means by abstract labor because it says that you know they you know you know they they must have you know must have thought of uh, money and so that you know that that could you know be a measure of abstract labor 
And I think Marx would have said, you know, that's that's not how abstract labor works. You know, you don't come up with an idea and you say, well, money would be good for measuring this yeah, 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 right. because it only exists within monetary production. If he, I mean, he calls this real abstraction. So it's something that must happen in monetary exchanges. And, you know, uh, it, it sort of happens behind yes. the backs yes. of yes, the exactly. producers. And then, you know, you know, we might recognize it uh, as you know, participants of the economy or as scientists, but it's something where you can't really say you have the idea and then sort of you apply to the economy because it, it happens in the economy. So yeah. that's why, you know, I think that sort of the, the, the intervention against your, your position doesn't really work, at least not with- No, it Marx. doesn't work in multiple ways. Yeah. I'm, I mean, I'm, I'm writing a review of this book, so I'll, I'll remember your point. I have this idea, idea that, that um, transcend, transcendental forms come first. And from that you and also this idea of explaining the world from the world i mean that's obviously a sin in certain circles yeah. <laughs> it, i mean it seems to be quite a good idea what's that i have a question about uh cosmization yeah uh and like uh, what kind of psychic process it is or what, like how much it encompasses. Um, and I don't think this like is a major issue for your argument or anything. I'm just kind of curious how you're thinking about it. Cause like one, one way to think about in, is it something that happens consciously or unconsciously is one question I had. So like uh, very frequently we like, have a schema for understanding something and then we just transfer, you know, we purposefully transfer that schema onto something else to try to make sense of the something else, right? We do that, con you know, analogical reasoning or whatever. Um, but you could also think like, like Marx, I think, in the account of ideology, it's not, it's not that, right? It's something that, you know, uh, the you know it appears to us that the gods have these properties, but this is a sort of psychic process that's happening behind our backs. Um, and those two different ways of thinking about it seem to me to be like the first one is more cognitively demanding, requires that we already have like a worked out schema in a way that we can then project onto something else, right? Um, so I'm just wondering yeah, yeah, how- yeah, yeah. No, indeed. I mean, you're raising the question of ideology and its relation to cosmization. In a way, yeah. Uh, I mean, the answer to your question, is it unconscious? Basically, yes. It's also collective. I mean, if you, to take the most simple example of cosmization, Zeus is a god, but he's a patriarchal monarch. Not every feature of a patriarchal monarch the details of his daily life, uh, his mortality and so on, but not, they're not all cosmized. Um, but he has a scepter and a beard and a throne and his power and the rest of it. That is, is, is un surely, I mean, if I, here I am, a, in a, a, an ignorant peasant in 8th century Greece, and I look up in the sky and oh, I see the mountains and I want to know uh, who rules the world. And, um, so do many others of my ancestors and my offspring. So it's a, it, it, it's, there's a familiarity with monarchy, as you say, it's quite complex already there, but it just um, almost imperceptibly extends to the whole cosmos. I mean, so the answer is it's unconscious and it's collective. As far as its relationship with ideology is concerned, or with Marxism, you know, things happening behind the back. I don't know, it's a good question. I haven't really thought about that. So thank you. I'll try and think more carefully about that. Can I do a quick yeah, yeah. three follow-up? I mean, it might even be uh, cognitively beneficial in the sense that, uh, so like, so like I, I start thinking about the gods in terms of uh, the king, right? Or Zeus, you know, Zeus or whatever, a personified god. But then we start doing theology it makes possible thinking about those relations, right? That then can become useful for understanding uh, 
the phenomenon from which they were originally yeah. derived, right? So there's this kind yeah, of yeah, like, yeah. Everything has to be and then the king, it's... no, exactly, yeah. right? So then you understand the earthly king better as a result of doing the theology, <clears throat> right? Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. Um, and so it can be sort of a, like a, I don't know, a virtuous cycle. Yeah, I, I, I mean, the point is that, <laughs> The um, period I'm talking about, Greece in the sixth, fifth centuries, was a period in which there'd been significant decline of kingship. So you look at the Iliad, they've kind of got kings, but they're weak, more like chieftains. They don't have a state apparatus, their power seems precarious, just based on little more than charisma. And so, Bizarre philosophy. Uh, comes into being in a world in which the, the, the human model for the divine king doesn't really exist anymore. And that's, that's an important factor. Nevertheless, Zeus goes on until the end of antiquity. Um, it's, only, it's only an elite who ever entertained the kind of beliefs that I've been describing. And, and uh, as I said, it's partly because, precisely because they, they, they'll get much more power and security with money than with personal cons. Whereas most people, we don't have money, are dependent on personal gods and so on, go on believing them. And the, um, the emperor will also encourage that belief for good reasons of state. So you, you different positions in society, very for one's theology, of course, as always. Um, but uh, yeah, uh, but, but I think in the ancient Near East, looking at, at gods uh, in a society where the kings are still absolutely powerful would probably be better uh, instances of the kind of thing you're talking about. I can grab your attention. So um, Nick is on Zoom right now. He's raising a question in the chat. So if Ryan, right. if you have the question, if you could I can read it to you quick. Um, I don't know if he joined, I think he joined after you had already responded, but um, he said, your theory explains the advent of the ideas of metaphysical cosmology and philosophical value in general, but have you considered engaging with the philosophical arguments given for transcendental forms, the good, the soul, etc., as opposed to offering an alternative theory? So, for example, Plato does not simply say the good, the beautiful forms, and the soul exist, but argues why they must exist. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I am familiar with, by the way, so Nick, Nick was listening to all of this. I, I, I think so. The question joined me. I'm not sure. I see. Yeah. Uh, Jeffrey Lloyd wasn't listening. As well. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yes. No, it's a good point. And um, yes, I mean, I, I have read and considered the Platonic arguments. And one of the, the ironies here is that I, my analysis of Plato is part of my theory. So Plato's orientation. For example, in relation, I know it's very different, in relation to slavery, Plato has a metaphysics of slavery. You know, slavery is built into his conception of the construction of the universe. The noose, the mind, the noetic part of the universe, uh, enslaves the material part of the universe. Again, that's not a metaphor, or it's not only a metaphor. It's a serious cosmization of this fundamental institution. And it's not as if I'm trying to attack Plato, because I'm not, I'm mean, some very, very good arguments. Uh, in Plato, Plato's you know, the, the, the philosopher who makes the notion of the self-contained soul, uh, that is the, the, the definitive um, version of it in antiquity. Or most philosophers in the ancient world are Platonists. Uh, and it's a very, very seductive and beautiful conception, actually. And there are passages of the Phaedrus, in particular of the Republic, which are, which are wonderful. I, and the soul is also there in the meadow, as subject to reincarnation, as, as it is in the Phaedrus and so on. Um, but it's not, they're not logically compelling. I find them aesthetically and emotionally very compelling. But I don't think many people find them logically compelling. I mean, the argument that you must have had a previous life uh, have been written. Really, the argument in favor of reincarnation in the Phaedrus, because you have these memories, or in the Meno, they have these memories of beautiful uh, people. In the Meno, the slave boy instinctively knows geometry, even though 
who's never had any instruction in it, you can give clearly accounts of the psyche which explain those phenomena without invoking reincarnation. But for Plato, it's about reincarnation. So I'm very respectful of Plato, but I don't, I don't regard him as a, able to be a serious thinker in these, these particular matters, a very compelling writer, yes. Have any last questions um, before we pile into the van? Yeah. Uh, we have dinner reservations at seven. Um, so, Zoli, what? Yes. It's a please to please to report that it's a it's a short one um, about cosmization. Um, does it does cosmization for you always take the form of recognizing the most powerful thing in the neighborhood and imagining it across the across the sky? Well, I think that. Um, <clears throat> Um, in a sort of Eliade universe, it doesn't have to be the most powerful thing in the universe. It could be this temple. Well, that, well, that's, when you imagine the most powerful thing in your life, your father or the king yes. oh, or your store of wealth, yeah. and then you imagine something like that. Yes. 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 I mean, it is, it is about power. It is a, um, um, basically, that's absolutely yeah. right. Yeah. Okay. And, and money is powerful and kings are powerful. Yeah. So then, I mean, so again, I guess then the question is, do you think that all human beings everywhere in all times and places have this tendency to imagine whatever's materially powerful as abstractly powerful? And if so, why, why does that psychic disposition appear everywhere? Well, um, I wouldn't say abstractly powerful. I'd say okay. cosmically powerful. Sure, sure. Because uh, abstraction, it really isn't abstract most of the time. The Greeks are making abstract. Uh, why does that exist cross-culturally? Good question. I mean, I think here, so here there are, uh, the, I've tried to be interdisciplinary in my life. I've done economics and philosophy and literature and all the rest of it. Uh, but I'm hopelessly uh, lacking in, for example, cognitive science, which would really help to answer the kind of question that you're asking. And anthropology, which would also help. And comparative anthropology, I mean, knowing the answer to these cross-cultural anthropological questions, it wasn't impossible. Um, and so one needs a kind of, would need a team effort to answer your question. It's a very good question, but... But it's going to be open to being hard wires or something like that. Yeah, yeah, yes. I mean, so you know that you will find cultures somewhere who don't do this sort of thing. Uh, oh, maybe not. I don't know, but it's quite possible. But I imagine most people envisage cosmic power in terms of social power. Um, it would be sort of odd if they didn't, really. How else would you imagine it? You could imagine the world is controlled by animals, dragons or whatever, but usually what you imagine is there's a ferocious cosmic channel, um, <clears throat> dragon who's slain by a king. That's, 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 um, that's much more fun. I mean, I guess my, my question was more, why not worry about dealing with the king or your father or your money? Why imagine something in the sky at all and why does... Yes, <laughs> again, well, that's a sort of, I, 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 at a certain point I thought Piaget might help me with this, but it doesn't, <laughs> so I don't say about it, Piaget. An interesting attempt to answer more or less exactly that question in Robert Bella's Religion and Human Evolution, which is a yeah. surprisingly good book given the awful title. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, he, he takes my work seriously, so he's obviously a prime. Yes. 